If you got your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John with me. We're in the Gospel of John today, and uh, boy, I'm excited to preach through this section of the text. Um, but just a warning, it is heavy, because we've worked our way all the way through the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John has had a wonderful message of God's love for people, God's reaching out to people, God wanting to be involved in our lives and doing everything to reach out and to make himself accessible. Uh, And so we've been looking at the beauty of John's gospel. John's gospel is a gospel of love, but John has also told us that his purpose is to convince us that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And so we have come to the point in John's gospel where it gets a little bit heavy, and that's where we are at today. John chapter 19, we're going to read verse 16, but we are at the point where the Jews have handed Jesus over to Pilate. Pilate and Herod uh, um, are about to condemn Jesus to be crucified because the Jews are insisting that they want to get rid of this man. They hate his message, and, and we see that some in the world today, the, the message of, of Jesus Christ doesn't always resonate <clears throat> with everyone, and, and uh, that breaks my heart, but, but hopefully it resonates with you today. And so uh, we've got three parts. I think today we're going to look at um, apologetics. Instead of what does the death of Christ mean for us, what I wanted to do is look at apologetics about the death, and apologetics means... Um, evidences and discussions for someone that's a skeptic. Someone that maybe doesn't believe that the Bible is really inspired, the Word of God. Someone that might not believe uh, in the death and burial and resurrection in Jesus. Maybe somebody that doesn't believe that Jesus was real. Uh, There are people that think that that was mythology, that it's all just kind of been made up. And so the direction that I've taken with the text today, we're going to read John's account of the crucifixion of Christ. And then we're going to look at some things outside of the Bible. So there's three things. We're going to look at John's eyewitness account of the crucifixion. It's important that you know that what we're about to read uh, was written down by the Apostle John, someone who walked and talked and touched and heard the real Jesus of history, and he is going to tell us, I saw what I'm telling you, I saw it with my own eyes. So we're going to read his own eyewitness of that, but there are people that say, well, you can't prove the Bible using the Bible. That's called circular reasoning. I need something outside of the Bible to corroborate that message. So we're going to look at Um, The reliability. Has anybody proven or told us that these manuscripts are reliable? And then thirdly, I want to show you about what's called corroborating evidence. Has anybody in antiquities other than Christians written or talked about this Jesus? Or is it only Christians and only the Bible? And so that's called corroborating evidence. Is there anybody else that's written about these things? So I'm going to give you all three of those. The eyewitness account, uh, why we believe that this is accurate and reliable. That's the second one. And the third one is corroborating evidence. Has anybody other than Christians ever written about Jesus? Today we're going to look at his death. Next week we're going to look at the empty tomb. And we'll look at apologetics for the empty tomb. And the week after that, we'll look at the resurrection. And is it possible to prove the resurrection? So if you'll join with me, take your Bibles. We're going to look at John chapter 19, verse 16. Jesus is in the praetorium with Pilate right now. And the Jews are insisting that they want him crucified. So he delivered, so Pilate delivered him over to the Jews to be crucified. They took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side. 
and Jesus was in between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic and in Latin and in Greek. And so the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and they divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. Also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless. It was woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but let's cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture that said they divided my garments amongst themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, this disciple took her to his own home. And we know that this disciple that he's not naming here is John, the apostle Jesus loved, the one that's writing this account for us. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch. They held it up to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross for the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high Sabbath, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken so that they could be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus... They saw that he was already dead. So they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth so that you also might believe. These things took place that the scripture could be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture, they took him. They will look on him whom they have pierced. So there's the eyewitness account of the crucifixion of Jesus. And, And what I wanted to look at today is the assuredness that we have that Jesus died because there are some theories that have been proposed. One of them is called the swoon theory, that Jesus just passed out, but that he didn't really die. And that was why when they took him off the cross, they kind of stole his body or he escaped. That's been disproven. And there's lots of others uh, in the Quran, or, or I don't remember if it's the Quran or just in Islam, but it says, as a surety, Jesus was not crucified. He did not die. Because in that religion, a prophet of God can never be humiliated. So they deny the death here. And there's other religions. Uh, The Hindus say that uh, Jesus escaped and went to India. But it's important because Paul had said in, in, in Corinthians that if Jesus did not really die and resurrect, then the Christian faith is really of no value to anybody. So we're looking at this. Uh, here we have the eyewitness of, of, of John. 
And if you look down there, John 19, that verse 35, he who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true, he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also might believe. <clears throat> so what we have here is, a, is a, a manuscript or a document that is saying he's an eyewitness. <clears throat> the second question is, okay, for the reluctant person, for the skeptic, and I hope you'll pay attention if, if you're skeptical today uh, because I'm doing my best to give you as all the proofs, legitimate proofs that I can. Uh, so you have a document that, that he says is true and reliable, but is there, is there a way to corroborate the reliability of this manuscript that we have? One important uh, witness that we have, this is uh, an article written in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The Journal of American Medical Association, 1986. They have a no, no affiliation with Christianity. They're a medical journal and really thought of to be an authoritative, an authoritative source. And they got a group of doctors together to figure out what the crucifixion was like, what the crucifixion would do to the human body. And they actually had people that volunteered to go through the stages of this crucifixion minus the nails. Okay, so they recreated the crucifixion, all the events minus the nails. They tied people to these posts. And um, we're going to look at those findings but uh, the one thing that the journal had to do is they said, well, what are we going to use for our account of the crucifixion? And so they investigated the uh, evangelistic manuscripts, and here's what they published in the Journal of American Medical Association. I've got it on the board for you here. It says, using the legal historical method of scientific investigation, scholars have established the reliability and the accuracy of the ancient manuscripts. So they said that we can rely and we can depend on these accounts of the crucifixion because they are reliable and accurate. Scholars have determined using scientific methods of investigation that yes, we can depend on what's been written here. Lee Strobel also uh, wrote a book on the investigation of the death and resurrection. Lee Strobel says, <clears throat> first of all, yeah, Lee Strobel says, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the best attested event in all of the ancient world. Now, those are very strong words coming from a man who was a, a Yale, a graduate of the Yale Law School, he was the legal editor for the Chicago Tribune, and he was an atheist. Lee Strobel was an atheist until he was asked to do a report on investigating the death and the resurrection. So an atheist undertakes to investigate these things, and in 1981, he publishes The Resurrection of Jesus is the Best Attested Event in the ancient world. There's no doubt about it. So those are a couple proofs that I want to give you for the reliability and the accuracy of the manuscripts that have been compiled into this one book that we get our information from. A third uh, evidence that the courts would want is corroboration. Okay, they want to say you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible. We need corroborating. We need other outside sources. So I wanted to give you a few of these outside sources. These are non-Christian people uh, back about the first or second century, the time of Jesus, and these are things that non-Christians wrote about the history of these events. The first one is Josephus. Josephus was a Jew, but in the war, the first Jewish war, 66 to 70, when Rome was coming in and devastating Thousands and thousands of Jews. Josephus thought, you know, it might just be smart for me to change sides. And you could do that then. You could form an alliance with the armies that were coming in and devastating your country. Uh, you could form an alliance because they viewed that as a strength. And so 
Uh, Josephus was a Jew. Keep in mind, it was the Jews that insisted that Jesus be crucified. Uh, and he switched over to Rome for protection, and he became a historian for Rome. So Josephus give us an account here of Pilate and Jesus. Uh, now there was at this time Jesus. Jesus was a wise man. And I put periods here. I didn't write the whole thing, but Josephus says Jesus was a wise man. If you could even call him a man. We don't know that Josephus ever embraced Christianity, but he undoubtedly said if you could even call him a man. He won over many of the Jews and the Greeks. And Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, condemned him to be crucified. Those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affections for him. That's one account. Tacitus. Tacitus was actually a Roman. Tacitus was a Roman historian. And he also writes about what happened in Rome in 70 AD when they blamed the when Rome was set on fire. Tacitus writes about the fire in Rome and he lets us know that Nero blamed the fire even though everybody knows Nero started the fires himself because he wanted to rebuild Rome. Tacitus records this about <clears throat> the fires in Rome. <clears throat> Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class that was hated for their abominations. They were called Christians. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Another second century historical writer, Phlegon of Trails. Phlegon of Trails, uh, a second century writer, also had something to say about, interestingly enough, during the other accounts of the Gospel, there are miraculous events that happen at the crucifixion of Christ. If you remember some of them, it said that from noon till three, <clears throat> the sky turned dark, there was an earthquake, rocks were split in half, and people were resurrected from the dead. That's what the Gospels tell us. Here a second century writer is reflecting back on history and he says, In the time of Tiberius Caesar, during the full moon, keep in mind that a full moon means that the moon was on the opposite side of the sun. <clears throat> On the full moon, a full eclipse of the sun happened from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, corroborating the gospel accounts. What is, what is common, he says, what is common about an earthquake and eclipse and rocks that are torn apart and the rising of the dead? Such a huge com cosmic movement, <clears throat> what could have possibly caused this? It was a God-sent darkness because the Lord happened to suffer and the Bible in Daniel supports that 70 spans of 70 years would come together right at the time that Jesus was crucified. <clears throat> we could go on and on with these corroborating accounts. A corroborating account is someone other than the gospel writers talking about the same event. We've got three of them that I've shared with you, four of them. Uh, the historian Gabe, Gary Habermas says that there are a total of 18 extra-biblical sources, non-Christian, non-biblical sources, that corroborate over 100 of the facts concerning the life and death of Jesus. So you've got the corroborating accounts. Uh, <clears throat> what I wanted to get into a little bit is uh, discuss a little bit about the crucifixion because the point today is to say for sure that the swoon theory, the idea that Jesus just passed out and didn't really die, just doesn't hold water. So we're going to look at the, the surety of his death today. And it starts out with the words I've highlighted there in, in green. <clears throat> John chapter 19, verse 5. I'll start reading this to you. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And when the chief priests, the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. The first startling thing is 
Uh, you know, when, you, when you're reading the Greek, you expect to see that same word, but the word there is staudo, staudo. So I thought, well, that's a new one for me. Let me look up what that means. What is staudo? Staudo is what's translated crucify here. Staudo. <clears throat> the definition in the theological dictionary of the New Testament Greek. The definition of stauro is an upright stake in the ground. <clears throat> Up on the board here, an upright stake in the ground, uh, it was commonly used to describe something that was fenced in with stakes put in the ground, like fence posts. It was also used, staudo, when they fortified a city with stakes that were driven into the ground around the outside of the city. <clears throat> so this word staudo literally meant stakes in the ground that surrounded an area. So this is the image of what the word literally means. It also meant to fortify a city with stakes. So here you've got another idea, fortification of a city with stakes in the ground. And so obviously inquiring minds want to know, how do we go Staudo meeting a fence post? How do we get to the cross from a word that means a fence post. So I want to describe the evolution of how this word came to mean from a fence post eventually came to mean crucifixion. Um, it takes 2,000 years for this word to go from meaning a fence post to meaning crucifixion. And I want to trace that down for you. Um, I kind of wish I'd have never <laughs> learned about this first word, impalement. Impalement, there are records of impalements, and you can tell it's basically a fence post that a person gets impaled on. 2,000 years before Christ, this method of execution was already being used, and the word for this fence post became the word that was known for this horrible death that was reserved for only the most wicked uh, of people. The Babylonians, 1,700 years before Christ, uh, have records of impaling people for punishments. One woman was impaled because she killed her husband in order to be with another man. You can imagine how gruesome. Impaling was done all different ways. And uh, to be honest with you, it, it, <laughs> I don't want to say it discouraged me, but I couldn't, I couldn't believe uh, uh, how depraved human beings can be in their torture, wanting people to suffer, wanting people to have horrible, horrible deaths. And it's important to understand also that in cities where sometimes their military force was probably underfunded, like many cities today, they probably didn't have as many soldiers or police as they wanted. They used these horrific displays of death to discourage anybody from rebelling, right? <clears throat> After the Babylonians, we go down to the Phoenicians, 1,200 years before Christ. The Phoenicians were impaling people on these uh, straos, <clears throat> these fence posts, for perceived acts of sacrilege against their local god. There is a record. <clears throat> There's a record of some Syrians that are worried because one of their own citizens was taken captive in the Phoenician town of Sidon. The Phoenician town of Sidon, you might remember that Jezebel was from Sidon, this Phoenician town. And these Syrians were worried because one of their citizens had been taken captured there. He was profaning the local god of the city, the local deity. And so they took him captive and his punishment would be impaling like this. And so they were <clears throat> overwhelmed figuring out how were they going to go rescue their own citizen from this Phoenician town before he was impaled, killed in such a, a horrible way. <clears throat> this is a, uh, well, I forget what you call something like this, uh, a relief, I guess, but if you can tell what it is, this picture on the bottom is two soldiers uh, with a staudel, a stake, and they're driving it up through the rib cage of these people, and they're sus suspending them in the air off the ground. This thing is uh, going up through their rib cage, and there are even uh, explicit information that they had <clears throat> about how to drive these stakes through people, how to miss the vital organs, 
and how to make how to prolong the death one hour, two hours, three hours. I mean, it's just savage cruelty. And, and the reason I'm showing you this, the evolution of the crucifixion is to leave no doubt that by the time Christ is crucified, this horrible form of death had been perfected over 2,000 years. Horrible people are trying to figure out what's the most painful, long, stretched out way we can kill people we don't like. Polybius, another historian, records something called the Mercenary Wars on Carthage. The Mercenary Wars on Carthage were about 200 years before Christ. <clears throat> and um, Carthage had hired mercenaries to help them go to war with Rome. After they won this small victory, the Punic Wars, the mercenaries that they hired wanted to get paid. Carthage didn't have any money to pay them. So all the mercenaries gang up against Carthage and they're furious and they're going to impose the most exquisite pains on the Carth Carth Carthinians for not being able to pay them for the war that they helped them to win. And so there are records of how they decided to kill the Carthinians. 700 men had their arms and legs broken, their hands were cut off, they were castrated, they were thrown into pits, left to die, and for the biggest atrocities they were crucified after they had been tortured. And so this method of impalement and crucifixion has been evolving over 2,000 years. Seneca the Younger is another Roman Stoic philosopher. Uh, Seneca, what's interesting about Seneca is he was born and lived at the same time of Christ. Pretty fascinating. He writes histories, and here's what Seneca wrote when he got to Rome and saw these crosses, these staudos, these impalement methods. Seneca writes, I see the stipes. Stipes was the name for the stakes that were planted in the ground. I see the stakes, the stipes there, but not just of one kind, but there were many different kinds. <clears throat> Some had their victims with the head down towards the ground. Some had impaled the victims through their private parts but others had stretched out the arms of their victims on the gibbet. The gibbet was a new form of execution where they put a crossbar on this upright stake that was in the ground. And so by Jesus' time, you have someone recording that they were using all these different methods of execution and this one new one where instead of impaling the person where they died too soon, they put a crossbar on it. And they stretched out their arms and they hung them on this crossbar. So all that to be said, that the crucifixion had been perfected as a form of agonizing, <clears throat> drawn out, slow, painful death. In other words, <clears throat> nobody's going to survive this. <clears throat> In brief, I wanted to go over, this is a recreation of what it would have looked like by the time that Jesus underwent this. <clears throat> I want you to notice there's something inaccurate about this picture here. The main form of death for the crucified person, besides the pain and all the things that underwent, and I want to describe some of that, you were literally hanging from your arms. And if you look at this, he's not hanging from his arms. He's supporting himself with his legs. But literally what happened is the arms were hung up high and you literally were hanging. So if you've ever, can you remember as a kid hanging from the, uh, what do we call it, the jungle gym, the monkey bars on the playground? Next time you take your kids to the playground, try hanging from the monkey bars and try staying there for any period of time. Your chest gets so tight that you start losing your breath as you're hanging on the monkey bars. You start getting short-winded for some reason. It's restricting your ability to breathe. And really, that's how the crucified person died. What they would do is they would nail the feet underneath, but you were nailed in this half-squatted position. If you've ever done half-squats, where your knees are bent down, and what you had to do if you wanted to breathe is you had to be willing to push yourself up on your feet to get a breath of fresh air. But as you know, when you did that, your back, which was already cut up, would be scraped along the post. So it was an agonizing death. Uh, you remember Jim Caviezel? made the passion of the Christ. Anybody see that? Ooh. I had, I had to leave the theater during the, the scourging. I couldn't, I couldn't. I couldn't even deal with listening to him, to hearing him. I came back in later. But 
Jim Caviezel was, was reenacting the crucifixion, right? But what's interesting is he tells us that some of the stuff didn't go as planned. Uh, one of the things that happened is when they threw him down in one of the, theme, well, one of the scenes, he dislocated his shoulder. And he said that for the rest of this uh, scening, it was the most horrible pain. He had felt a dislocated shoulder to keep filming with a dislocated shoulder. And we're going to talk about dislocated shoulders. Uh, he said that during the whipping scenes, a board was placed across his back. And so the guys were really smacking him with the whips, but they were hitting this board that was on his back. But he said on one particular occasion, one of the guys stepped too close and the whip went over the board and actually cut his side. <clears throat> he said that he was hit with such velocity that it knocked the breath out of him. It was like getting the wind knocked out of you as if falling on your back and not being able to catch your breath. The sting was so horrific that I couldn't catch my breath. And that was one accidental landing on him. He said he received a 14-inch gash from that accident and eventually he caught pneumonia because they had stripped him down and it was cold weather. And we know that when Jesus was crucified, it was cold enough that they had to build a fire for Peter and the disciples to warm themselves by the fire. So in addition to all the pain, to imagine Jesus freezing. The other, said, uh, the other thing that Jim Caviezel added is he said, here I am just imitating the crucifixion. And he said, but what you have to realize is I'm half naked <clears throat> it was freezing out. I'm in a little bit of pain because I had dislocated my shoulder and I had a 14-inch cut on my side. And he said, and I have to look down at the directors that are all sitting in their chairs drinking uh, Starbucks coffee with their jackets on. They're all warm and cozy drinking their coffee and I'm up here freezing to death. And he said, I can't describe how furious I was that everybody was so comfortable down here with their jackets and their lattes and their, and I'm the one that's up here freezing to make this scene happen, and it wasn't even real. And Jim said, I can't imagine what Christ was going through when, when he went through that. Very interesting to, to kind of think about that for a moment. Jim said he was angry at all the people that were down there having it good. The next thing we come to, um, the scourging, the maiming, the hemorrhaging, the dehydration, uh, put this person into hypovolemic shock. Uh, there was pain and thirst at the loss of blood, the loss of fluids. And if, if we can do this, guys, if Steve or Joe back there, if somebody can, uh, I got a little clip for you to play that little movie. I'm hoping that that'll, that'll work. But uh, before you hit play, you can go ahead and find it. But before you hit play, I got a little clip from a movie. Uh, this is a, 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 a Clint Eastwood Western, and Clint Eastwood and these guys are going to go chase the bad guys, and the problem is Clint Eastwood is now an old cowboy, and he's not a very good, he's not a very good shot anymore. So Clint Eastwood shoots a guy through the stomach, and the unfortunate thing about getting thought, shot through the stomach is you're just going to kind of slowly bleed, and it's going to take a long time for this guy to die. And I got a little clip of this guy dying, and I want you to pay attention to what the guy says while he's, while he's dying. Okay, Steve, I'm ready when you are. Oh, we're not, we're not going to be able to see it? Yeah, close the slide maybe, reduce the... <clears throat> you might have to close down... Uh... <clears throat> Basically... The scourging and, the, and the, uh, the hemorrhaging, the dehydration, the loss of blood, the loss of fluids. When uh, hypovolemic shock came on was that when the body loses 20% of its fluids, your mouth dries up, your body has lost fluids, and it's trying to get replenished. 
And uh, might not might not be able to see it. Huh. Well, that's okay. If you can find it, uh, Steve, well, that's great. Uh, I'll just keep going here. <clears throat> anyway, what happens in the clip is the boy is shot through the stomach. As he's slowly bleeding to death, you can tell his mouth is getting drier and drier and drier, and he starts crying out, I'm so thirsty, you guys. I'm so thirsty. Please give me a drink. And there's a medical reason for that is when you're slowly bleeding and losing fluids, when you go into shock, you, you get thirsty. And I thought that was an interesting way of portraying that Jesus, what Jesus went through. Um, I don't know if I've got it on the board there, but Jesus cried out, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. <clears throat> the last thing about the, the Roman crucifixion is four guards were assigned to a person when they were crucified. Four guards were assigned to him and they had to stay by his side until the person was pronounced dead. If the guards ever let someone go without dying, they themselves were killed. So the, the possibility of Jesus being let off the cross without being dead is, is impossible. Um, they would break the legs in order to speed up the death and then jab a spear through the side. In short, the crucifixion, uh, according to the, the Journal of American Medical Association, crucifixion is a medical catastrophe. Arms are, 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 are out of socket. Ligaments, tendons are torn. Have you ever hit your funny bone and how it sent a sting through your hand? Well, they said that when they pierced uh, the nail through the wrist, it would be just like somebody taking a wrench and pulling on that funny bone. So extreme agony. Um, so much so that the Latins wanted to, had to come up with a new name for pain because there was no name for the kind of pain that was endured during the crucifixion. And the word they came up with is excruciating. <clears throat> You've all heard the word, right? But did you know it came from the crucifixion? <clears throat> the word excruciating came from witnessing what death was like on a cross. So, um, to finish up, Steve, we'll just go ahead and go back to the, the PowerPoint, I think. I got... <laughs> the torturous execution of the cross had been perfected over a 2,000 year period of time. That's how we got from the word staudel, meaning a fence post, to eventually meaning a post with a cross beam. The eyewitness accounts, we have experts that say that the manuscripts that we have are authentic and accurate and reliable. <clears throat> and I want to finish up showing you the summary that was actually published in the Journal of American Medical Association. You can find it on the internet. It's a PDF. It's called um, The Crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's an article, it's a PDF, you can find that, and I want to give you the, uh, the summary here. You think we can pull the PowerPoint back up? Oh, okay. <laughs> While we wait for that, uh, that summary, uh, I didn't give you the theology of the death of Christ. Why did it need to happen? Uh, what I wanted to give was the skeptic some things to consider. That it's, it's not just recorded in the scripture, but there are <clears throat> many references outside of Christianity in Roman history that all corroborate the same. Thanks, Steve. The same. I don't know if you, uh, if you can read this, but I'll read it to you. This was the, uh, <clears throat> the summary in the journal. Jesus of Nazareth underwent Jewish and Roman trials and was flogged and was sentenced to death by crucifixion. The scourging produced deep, stripe-like lacerations and appreciable blood loss, and it probably set the stage for hypobolemic shock, as evident by the fact that Jesus was too weak to carry his own cross to Golgotha. <clears throat> At the side of the crucifixion, his wrists were nailed to the patibulum, that's the cross beam, and after the patibulum was lifted up and put onto the upright post, his feet were nailed to the post. The major patho 
pathophysiologic effect of crucifixion was an interference with normal respiration. He couldn't breathe. Accordingly, death resulted primarily from hypovolemic shock, exhaustion, asphyxia. Jesus' death was ensured by the thrust of a soldier's spear into his side. Modern medical interpretation of the historical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead when he was taken down from the cross. In another section of the same article, there was this last piece here. Clearly, the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted, and it supports the traditional view that the spear that was thrust between his right ribs and perforated not only the right lung, but also the pericardium and the heart, thereby ensured his death. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. It was impossible for him to have survived that. The theology, somebody would ask, well, why? And the reason is love. Jesus said that I came to sozo. I came to save you. And the question would be, why do we need to be saved Jesus being the Son of God, Jesus having come from heaven, knew that one day God was going to come to get rid of evil, to get rid of death. There was going to be a judgment day. And Jesus said, I had to come because I wanted to save you guys from that. That there was a death that needed to be happened because holiness cannot be around sin. It's the nature of holiness. And Jesus said, but but God loves you enough that he wanted to do something to fix that problem. And the way to fix that problem, Jesus said, is to have me pay for your sin. It was an act of love and hopefully a drawing uh, to Jesus for that reason. A drawing to Jesus for having paid that price and and freed us and and made it possible for us to have a relationship with a loving God that also says, because of my holiness, sin can't be in my presence. And so Jesus had to undergo the most horrific of acts because he said, I came to save you. I came to to make it possible for you to have a relationship with my Father. I hope that's given you some practical evidence to believe in the reality of Jesus and the the confirming of the death. Next week, we're going to look at the empty tomb, and we'll do the same thing. We're going to use some apologetics to prove that the tomb was found empty. And then the week after that, we'll prove the the resurrection with uh, some more apologetics. I hope it's had an impact on your heart. I hope that somewhere in there... You can realize that there was a a loving action made on your behalf so that you could have a relationship with God. And that happened through the crucifixion of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. Father, I pray on the hearts of people that may have been skeptics, may have been on the fence, or just may have just, for whatever reason, spent their whole life being told that it's all just a myth, that that there's no corroborating evidence. There's nothing outside of the made-up things in the Bible that prove it. And Father, they've just been hiding the biggest lie that the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the best attested event in all of ancient history, Father. The implications of that, that even more than the Trojan Wars, even more than the Caesars, even more than the conquests of Alexander the Great, things that everybody holds to be true, that there is more information, more attestation to the death and resurrection of Jesus in history than there is for any other event that has been recorded. Father, I pray that you would be on the hearts of men that have doubted that, that you would be merciful and open eyes to see the truth 
of the historicity of our Messiah and Savior. We love you. Thank you for your mercy. In Christ's name, amen.